Yeah, we're back. We're live. We're finding our future. That's the name of the show. Dore Shin can't make it today, but I'm stepping in for her. And let me say that finding our future is getting more complicated all the time. And to help us understand that is a person who deals with, I guess, now in science and the future in science, Chip Fletcher of SOAS. Uh, hi, Chip. Thank you for joining us on the show. My pleasure, Jay. It's good to see you again. The same. So, you know, uh, first, I want to congratulate you on uh, your recent award, the award ThinkTech gave you for community service and science service uh, to the state of Hawaii. Thank you so much for that. And uh, well, thank I, you. I it was fantastic. It was a, it was a great evening and uh, I was surprised and uh, I, I love the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to see you there and your family and all that. So, um, you know, uh, you're heavily involved in climate change and the amelioration of climate change. Uh, perhaps there's no one else in the state who's on a scientific level. Um, and, and this is very relevant to us uh, because we're, we're working at the suggestion of some of our underwriters. We're working on a program called uh, Climate Change Unfolding in Hawaii. And that's a, that's a verb that seems to apply because we'll find out more yeah. as we go along. And, and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do about it. We'll find out more about our abilities to, to deal with it as we go along. And I actually, I'm hoping that you'll help us with that um, as a, Absolutely. As a, in terms of just testimony about what's going on and consulting as to how we can handle that, that particular show. So anyway, um, let's, let's take a look at, um, you know, what you've been doing. Um, let's take a look at, uh, at, at, at your vision of it. First of all, I, I know you're, you know, I remember you're doing all these uh, charts and graphs about, uh, about sea level rise and, and about <laughs> the inundation of our beaches and coastlines. It's always very encouraging to look at that. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's going to have a huge effect on tourism. That is to the extent we still have tourism left at that time. Because, you know, part of the thread of this show, Chuck, is to talk about the relative priorities of existential threats. So one of them certainly up to this point has been clearly, and the School of Journalism always says this, that, that climate change is the most existential threat. Therefore, um, the most important journalistic story we have anywhere, it threatens the species. Uh, so you've been making those charts and graphs and I'm sure you've gone further because you're on the Climate Change Commission of the County. And I wanna know, you know the depth and breadth of your activities these days. Oh, so we're going to start with a small question, huh? I'm giving you plenty of room, Chip. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> That's of scope. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, COVID-19 is the issue of the day. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm calling in from home here. Uh, there are people all over the state, all over the world, in fact, now working from home. It's interesting how climate change and influenza uh, map onto each other. In fact, a new study just came out um, indicating that um, high levels of uh, weather variability, uh, that is the occurrence of heat waves um, that, are, that develop suddenly, uh, have been shown to have a 50% probability of increasing uh, the, the uh, influenza epidemic potential by mid-century, that's only 30 years from now for mid-latitude uh, locations. So think of the continental U.S., most of Europe, uh, much of Asia. It is the uh, dramatically warming days that are uh, forcing our um, immune system and our, the thermoregulation of our body temperature to uh, to turn towards that need and away from um, battling uh, the incidence of influenza that may invade our bodies. And so it, it's conjectured in this paper that uh, as we go into warmer and warmer weather, uh, and we have these extremely hot days, the human body loses some ability to uh, mount the immune defenses against, um, against influenza. And, and so there's anywhere from a 20 to 50% increase in epidemic um, 
scale influenza uh, because of this uh, problem by mid-century in mid-latitude countries. So that, you know, that's, that's, that's the... the uh... Go ahead. This, has the, uh, does this paper or any evidence you heard um, support the notion as expressed by the Trump administration that when it gets warmer, uh, the, you know, the current pandemic will die down? No, in fact, this paper is suggesting that as we head into the summer, as we see the development of heat waves, and in 2019, we had two separate heat waves uh, in the continental U.S., and we had a record three heat waves in the EU, the European Union. As our bodies attempt to thermoregulate in the face of these extraordinarily high uh, temperatures, we will see reduced ability uh, to counteract uh, the invasion of influenza viruses into our bodies by our immune system. Yeah, you're not talking only about coronavirus. You're talking about influenza viruses. It could be any number of viruses going forward. This phenomenon, the paper reports, uh, can happen again and again as we get further into climate change. No? That's right. That's what it's projecting, that, that our susceptibility to epidemic scale influenza will grow with temperature. Well, here's an interesting question I'd like to put to you on the flip side of that. <clears throat> what about the other way around? Uh, coronavirus has an effect on our species. I mean, maybe other species too. You know, we've heard of species that have been involved, you know, in, in the creation of the virus. But um, so our species is changing its conduct. Our spe species is changing the way its, uh, its, its uh, communities and cities and countries and its, um, you know, its industry and, and um, activities in the world have been conducted. It's it's going to change. I, I don't think it's a temporary. You know, through the you know through the, the the spring or the summer. I think we're going to wind up, for example, social distancing ourselves and washing our hands going forward. Not only for Corona, but for other potential viruses. So human conduct is going to change. My question is: it's a hard question. Could that affect climate change? If we take advantage of it, yes. In fact, uh, I would hope that Hawaii specifically doesn't come roaring back in late 2020 or 2021 um, with the uh, same addiction that we have to tourists uh, that we've shown in the last two decades. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to refocus our uh, look at making ourselves safer as a coherent community, less dependent on uh, outside uh, goods and services, outside forms of revenue. Let's, let's take this opportunity to readjust our economy and anticipate that in the next 10 to 30 years, we may very well see a strong decline in uh, global trade. We may see climate emergencies hitting the ports that provide us with 90% uh, of our food. We may see uh, the cost of shipping um, spike, the cost of food spike, because these climate emergencies that are occurring on the mainland are making, and in Asia and elsewhere, are are making trade much more expensive. And by actually fulfilling the governor's initiative to grow more of our own food here in the islands, um, and if we do it in a way that uh, supports a growth in jobs, that supports a, um, a rising economy that's focused on internal effort, internal um, sustainability rather than always turning to one continent or another for the various things that we have become dependent on as we move towards the middle of the century and heat waves begin to take down bread baskets of the world during the summers and uh, ports and shipping begin to experience climate emergencies such as we saw in the port of Richmond 
last summer when wildfire took out the electricity around the San Francisco Bay Area and, and the port was shut down for 48 hours. Those sorts of emergencies are going to grow in frequency and intensity, and we need to be able to support ourselves. There is a term that uh, has been used, a lifeboat community. The Hawaiian version would be pu'u honua. Hawaii needs to be able to feed itself, to have our own water, and to have our own sustainable economy under which we can all thrive while areas in continental regions uh, are battling severe climate emergencies because the continents warm faster than the oceans. And in the summertime now, we see temperatures of four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial conditions in the central part of uh, North America, the European Union, uh, Eurasia. Those are temperatures at which food crops fail, at which uh, food and water systems become unreliable. And um, we need to anticipate this so that we can um, be a society that continues to thrive uh, as the rest of the world, um, I'm afraid, uh, is going to be dominated by growing chaos. Yeah, chaos being the operative word. Well, you know, I get a bunch of reactions to what you said, and one of them is, uh, um, gee whiz, uh, if you're looking at uh, dealing with climate change, and you have been, and sustainability and resilience and all that, all of a sudden, uh, with the entry of coronavirus, you realize, or I do, and you probably realized it before, is that sustainability means sustaining the species against viruses also. It's not just the weather. Um, it's not just the food source or the water source. It's it's viruses too. So now your mission is kind of expanded. This lesson over the past few weeks um, changes the way I would look at sustainability and uh, resilience. No. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just think of um, all the medicines that we all use. Uh, the type 2 diabetes and the type 1 diabetes, um, all of our insulin comes in from someplace else. I don't know that we, so we educate um, pharmacists, pharmaco pharmacologists in the state, but I don't know that we actually produce any medicines in the state. Um, that's, that's a key thing. And I was reading this morning that people had better uh, bulk up on their medicines. And um, you know, in the, in the eventuality that we'll have uh, less shipping arriving at the islands. It's a very mm. scary situation. And while I'm confident that we'll get through the, um, the current coronavirus problem, I hope that people don't fall back into complacency and uh, ignore this emergency. The, these emergencies of various types are mounting now. We have seen... Um, direct landfall of tropical cyclones and hurricanes. We've seen wildfire growing in Hawaii. We've seen coral bleaching. Sea level continues to rise. The king tides, the extreme tide flooding is increasing. Now we have medical issues and epidemic influenza. We, we can't just go back to thinking the way we've thought in the past. We need to add these all up and they need to equal a new way of living in the islands. Yeah, well, that's, that's two words going to be on the final exam, chaos. Um, and <laughs> what was the other one uh, you just mentioned? Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, complacency. We, we cannot afford complacency. And that, and that takes me to a, me. another. <laughs> that, and that takes me to this whole notion. You know, the president said he was uh, going to spend now hundreds of millions of dollars of dealing with coronavirus. And I said to myself, whoa. You know, it's, it's that's that's pretty interesting. I mean, if 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 he can do that and and actually win the game, that'll be terrific. Um, query, you know, we should be spending hundreds of millions of dollars, billions. Did I say millions? Billions of dollars on climate change if we want to address it properly. So if you add that up, you get many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions easily, trillions of dollars. 
Okay, and and you know we're already in a kind of big big time deficit in Washington, and the state of Hawaii doesn't have all that much money, and they're trying to raise taxes and all. We do not have the money to deal with either climate change, which is I'm sure you, you can speak to that. But also, but also you know with this combination effect of the of the virus and the need to deal with it as well. So what I what I get is that going forward, a our world is going to change, our lives are going to change, our society is going to change. In order to deal with this, and B, and this is a really tough question, actually, I, I hate to ask this question: Can the planet, after it changes in this way, and after it has to spend all this money, can the planet support the same level of population, or is, or are we going to have to cull the herd? Did you say cull the herd, Jay? That's what virus is doing. Virus is culling the herd, right? It's sweeping across our, our world and it's knocking off the older people. And when, you, when, when it's all said and done, the herd is gonna be less. The same notion here, these things cannot support, in my view, they cannot support the same level of population, 8 billion plus, whatever it is, as we have now. And nature is going to reduce the number or yeah, nature is gonna reduce the number of people who can live on the planet, don't you think? So, okay. So you are skipping to the, um, you're skipping to the punchline and, and of the range of punchlines you could choose, you're, you're choosing the uh, most draconian and, uh, and depressing of them all. So I'm not gonna buy into your narrative and instead I'm gonna point out a few things. Number one, the projections uh, coming from the energy economists of the world, uh, yes, uh, do project increased uh, and continued CO2 emissions. This is largely coming from the developing world who want to have the, the food and water reliability, the transportation systems, the education and hospital systems that the developed world has. And the quickest and easiest way for them to increase their uh, standard of living is using the embedded fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, that, that means that uh, we in the developed world need to assist the developing world with the deployment of renewable energy. If you take a look at these projections of carbon dioxide, they actually put us on a pathway of three to three and a half degrees Celsius uh, increased warming above the pre-industrial era by the end of the century, that is a far better pathway than the five or six degrees Celsius that was the worst case scenario that has been modeled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So we are not tracking the worst case any longer. We are tracking a middle of the road case. Given that three degrees C by the end of the century is still an incredibly dangerous and fraught world, and we had better uh, prepare ourselves for it. Can we live on this planet at our current population? Yes, we can if we change our habits. Habit number one, stop eating meat. This will significantly decrease deforestation across the planet. It will significantly decrease your own personal uh, exposure to cancer and a number of other diseases. Go vegetarian, and even better than that, go vegan. If everybody on this planet were to uh, eat a more plant-based diet, this would, this would push us an enormous step forward because uh, 26 to 31% of our greenhouse gas emissions come through the agriculture uh, chain from uh, the field to the table. We can also take advantage of the trend of human population moving into urban centers. As we retrofit and build uh, new buildings, let's make sure that these buildings uh, capture uh, and manage some of the water that falls on their property, if not all of it, uh, generate some or all of their electricity needs, um, grow some of their own food, and let's also have buildings talk to each other. Let's create, let's push forward the internet of things where, um, my refrigerator talks to the battery in uh, your car and figures out where's the best place to store electrons and where's the best place to draw electrons. Let's also take advantage of opportunities for increasing the education 
of uh, the future generation. I am not, a, you know, there's, there's an idea, unfortunately, among some folks that they don't want to have children because of the negative future uh, that science paints, but I think that's not the right response. I think the response is if you are, if you wish to have children and you're lucky enough to have children, let's uh, own the responsibility of educating those children so that they are making decisions based on uh, empiricism and that they are scientifically informed individuals. Uh, you know, making carbon pay for its real cost, um, just the way we've made cigarettes pay for their real cost on society, driving up the cost of health care, we should uh, implement a carbon tax. And as you probably know, there is a bill in the Hawaii legislature, which has just taken a break, but there's a bill in the Hawaii legislature for a carbon tax. We need to move strongly towards creating a carbon tax in Hawaii, and it will send a powerful message to the world. And there are, there are lots, dozens of things that we can do. Let me just mention one or two more. There is a massive investment opportunity in pulling carbon out of the air, turning it into a fuel such as kerosene, which is jet fuel, um, burning it, that carbon gets re-released into the air, we pull it out again. And if we can close the loop on burning carbon fuel source, we can totally replace fossil fuels. There are trillions of dollars of impact investors out there who are looking for opportunities to help humanity. This is one of the major areas uh, to take ourselves away from fossil fuels and um, not uh, and to buffer the step away from the internal combustion engine in its various forms um, and develop this sort of zero fuel opportunity. A friend of mine here in Hawaii would like to create a direct air capture plant located at every airport in the state, power it through either geothermal or renewable energy, pull carbon out of the air, generate uh, kerosene, which is uh, then can be used by um, the airline industry as jet fuel. And you know that could offer an opportunity for putting some cap on uh, the airline industry in Hawaii. If some portion of the jet fuel can be made through direct air capture, uh, this might offer a parameter under which we could uh, require, um, you know, put in place uh, limits on the airline industry. There are also possibilities for repairing climate. Formerly known as geoengineering, and everybody has a negative reaction to that. Uh, I, I think it's worth investigating protecting the Greenland ice sheet. Over the last two decades, the Greenland ice sheet has seen an increase in cloud-free days and uh, artificial creation of clouds over the Greenland ice sheet so that we uh, slow or decrease or eliminate the warming there would prevent seven meters of sea level rise, which would displace thousands of the world's cities if we allow it to happen. Um, and also there's a possibility of repairing the United Nations process, the COP process, which is currently dominated by the Trump administration going in and threatening uh, all the uh, players uh, with um, threats against their relationship to the United States if they happen to agree to the UN goals of, uh, of the COP. This is what happened in Madrid. I'm working with some folks to try and create a parallel process for the Glasgow COP, although um, there are rumors that it might be canceled because of the virus. But there are lots and lots of things that single individuals coming together with the determination to not allow the world to enter into the bleak future that, that we've become used to hearing about. Um, yeah. th there are things you for know, us to know, do, uh, and there are people on, on the job. Coronavirus teaches us some things. I mean, for example, uh, mul multiples, for the lack of cohesive action by the federal government, multiple states get together and, and they make kind of compacts on certain issues and actions dealing with the virus. Multiple countries in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere uh, get together. And, and so you find actual movement, um, collaboration, collaboration being the operative word. That, that's probably the third word on the final exam. I hope you put all these words on the final exam. Chaos and uh, not, um, uh, uh, I can never remember the word, you know, where people don't care. Uh, and, and finally, uh, um, you know, collaboration. Collaboration. So, 
Yes. So, so you know, what I get out of this is that we are learning we, by, by, by requirement. Necessity breeds invention. Necessity breeds collaboration. Uh, we are learning that to deal with this global epidemic, we have to collaborate. Uh, even the Trump administration has to collaborate. And, and um, we'll have to go through this passage together. We'll have to spend the money, find the political will, take the steps, agree on them and implement them. Um, this is really a lesson for everyone everywhere. And maybe that lesson uh, to a very existential threat, um, you know, also is applicable to climate change in general, which people don't get all that excited about. And, and politically, they, they don't do a whole lot and they, you can't find the political will. But maybe the virus will teach us how to find the political will for climate change, to spend the money, take the steps and so forth on a global a global cooperation. I'm, I'm hoping that's so. Um, you know, the question is, how do you do that? How do you start that? And I agree with you about education. Everybody has to be educated. So nobody, nobody is left behind. Nobody is, is rejecting science. How do you do that? So we have already collaboration in play with regard to climate change. We have an entity called the U.S. Climate Alliance. This is 25 states and over 400 cities. Together, they constitute the fourth largest GDP on the world. Um, they've all declared that they're still on board with the Paris uh, targets uh, from 2015. The United Nations uh, temperature targets of 1.5 and 2.0 degrees C warming. The US Climate Alliance um, has an office in Washington, DC and um, with grants that they've recently received, they are starting to staff up. This is, a poss this, this is an alliance that can go to the COPs, the Conference of Parties, which are, uh, happen every year sponsored by the United Nations. This is an alliance that can confer with each other and develop approaches towards a carbon tax. Even if a carbon tax can't be passed individually, which has been tried in several, uh, at least in Washington um, state, which has been tried and, and not successfully uh, succeeded, by having this climate alliance, there are leveraging opportunities and um, interstate agreements that could be made which can which can decrease the carbon footprint of things like trucking transportation of various types the airline industry etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, it, it we actually are seeing this collaboration if things go well we'll, we'll see this collaboration within the u.s uh, really take off are you in the, participating in, in it Jim? are you participating in these projects these organizations uh are you active? Yes. Who is leading them? Are, are you involved in that leadership? So there's a small group of us, about six of us, that have gotten together from the uh, legal side, from the United Nations side, from the um, global scale investment side, uh, from the science side, um, and from the energy technology side. And, and we have Skype meetings about once, once a month. Um, we are generating white papers. For instance, I want to go to the insurance industry and pose um, large scale experiments in carbon storage in the ocean as a risk reduction exercise. Um, this idea of mod clouds over the Greenland ice sheet, uh, we need an, a huge in, injection of funding to see what this modeling may tell us in terms of feasibility. Um, this approach through uh, the COP in Glasgow to create a parallel event for sub-nationals for climate alliances that are not national scale. Um, and, and there is uh, a UN program uh, which is geared towards, which has $4 trillion worth of investors that have signed on to certain principles of investment, principles that are focused on social equity and climate equity. We are talking to each other and we are not the only group of people like this that are collaborating. There's sort of little points of light, if you will, uh, as we discover each other. I'm very optimistic about the possibilities. Have to, have to build it into every student at SOAS, every student at UH. Um, every duration we can find, 
so that these younger generations carry it forward. You know, you and me are not going to be able to, you know, have this conversation, participate in these projects forever. So we, we need to, yep. we need to seed the community with people who are carry it forward. The last question I want to ask you is, uh, is this, um, Hawaii is a great laboratory and that's the premise of our program on unfolding climate change in Hawaii. It's a laboratory where you and others from UH and other schools can go out and examine the environment and see how it's working on the shorelines and in the ocean and see how the coral reefs are doing, how the weather and the water and the you know, agriculture and everything in the world and in, in the physical world around us is doing. So we can learn here and therefore we can share here. Furthermore, you're on the Climate Change Commission and others uh, seeking to develop political will for city and state governments here. Um, for officials at every level uh, to try to show them the way, show them what needs to be done and help them do it. Um, so Hawaii, I think, can be a laboratory. Hawaii can teach other places, perhaps more than most, about how this works, how it is unfolding and how the, uh, what do you call it, the community response to it is unfolding. Do you see it that way? Absolutely, that was really well stated. We are a living laboratory. Unfortunately, Hawaii is highly stratified economically, socially, and uh, these sorts of stratified communities do not do well when climate shocks occur. When you have, uh, for instance, the current um, pandemic or let's say massive heat wave or hurricane strike, um, when you have high disparities in income, communities like that have been shown in studies um, not to hang together under certain cases. That shock can sort of sever what is already a very thin connection uh, from one um, portion of the community to the next. So I would say that, you know, there's a number of important things that we need to increase, increase robustly over the next one to three decades. Among the very top two or three has to be repairing our social disparity, repairing the huge gap between the haves and have nots uh, in Hawaii. And if we can truly leverage the foundational culture of aloha and uh, take care of those who do not have as much as others, I think Hawaii could be extremely resilient as we move into the world fully digitized, fully electronic, feeding ourselves with abundant and healthy water. Um, we can be an example of how human society can turn back to earth, fall back in love with soil, fall back in love with the planet, and in so doing, we'll fall back in love with each other. That's the last... Uh term that will be on the final exam, back in love with the planet. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chip Fletcher. It's wonderful to talk to you, encouraging. And I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.